Good evening. Thank you for uh, attending our second uh, workshop on sea level rise. This is a partnership between the village, the foundation, and our residents about finding solutions, informing our public, and, and uh, mapping out a course that is efficient, effective, and uh, will keep us uh, around for many, many decades. So uh, I welcome you here tonight. This is our second session. We will be uh, addressing our survey results, best practices. We have a, a, a room full of wonderful engaged residents. We also have um, a, a couple of individuals who've been, uh, who are engaged in the village. We have from the Keep Us Gain Chamber Resilience Committee, Robert Dujolo. We have Vice Mayor Frank Kaplan, Council Member Luis de la Cruz, Council Member Katie Petros, Village Manager John Gilbert, Council Member Pat Woodson, BZ Director Judd Kalancha, Building Officer Eugene Santiago, and Mayor of Pinecrest, uh, Cindy Lerner. Welcome everyone. Let's get started. We have a lot to do today. And uh, now I would like to present our moderator for the evening, Irela Baguet from Coastal Systems. Good evening, everyone. And it's my pleasure to, I guess, be the uh, storekeeper here and keeping everyone uh, on time and, and try to get everyone uh, organized and get all your questions in and all your answers. Um, it is great to see how you are all uh, engaging in protecting your investments and working collaboratively with the village. With that, um, another uh, example of uh, public information and gathering more input from the village, uh, we decided to put out a uh, resident survey or citizen survey, because uh, not everyone has the time to come out to these meetings. And so we wanted to get more feedback based on some of the questions that were uh, asked uh, at the first town hall that we had. So with that, we have Dr. Manoj Chiglani who's going to walk you through uh, the questions that were asked in the survey. Maybe I'm um, make sure many of you answered uh, that you're here and uh, the, the uh, feedback that we got. And um, with information, we can again make great decisions together. So with that, Dr. Manoj Chiglani. Hi, I'm going to go over the results more than anything else. So this is what all of you had to say about what's going on. 87% of you say that coastal flooding and sea level rise is a future threat to Key Biscayne. Is that about right? Yes. No? Okay. The majority of you believe that you should be getting more information on the climate and sea level rise risks and adaptation solutions. Effectively, you have said that sea level rise is an issue and you do believe that adaptation needs to take place. What is it that we mean by adaptation? Well, you are in favor of raising roadways. Is that about right too? That raising roadways in front of your property is a solution that most of you favor. The other thing that we found, well, okay, I mean, so, so this, these are findings from a survey. Um, obviously, the, the survey was done with um, a few groups in mind. And also, the survey results represent the majority of you. Most of you believe that, that there is a threat, yes, and based on the sample, there are going to be differences in terms of whether there are solutions that most of you agree with, some of you don't agree with, that's something that we have the support for and, and the discussion. But the good thing is that the other thing that the survey found is that most residents are very receptive to getting more information. Um, they'd like to learn more about what these threats are, how they can be mitigated against, and what some of the options available might be. So going back to what the survey found, um, the results themselves suggest that there is at least from the survey sample a majority support for raising roadways in the village and front of properties to protect the village from flooding and future sea level rise. The other thing that was found was that there is uh, support for um, pumps and green adaptations. Interestingly, there's more support for, for green adaptations than there is for pumps. And in both of these cases, these adaptations, at least the way they were reported in the sample, 
are for um, actions to be taken proactively, not reactively. Um, the level of action to be taken basically against future flooding and sea level rise, most persons believe that that action should be taken, should be significant action, and only 5% of the sample felt otherwise. Again, the, 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 the answer is very much skewed in terms of action, and in terms of immediate action, as well as proactive versus reactive approaches. So that brings us to, and, and it's a very short term and that gets us to the three main findings that we can take from this sample's overall views concerning sea level rise and, and coastal flooding. The first is that there is an overwhelming concern about the future effects of coastal flooding and sea level rise. And this is something that's, that's something that we see in other barrier islands as well. So Miami Beach to the north, for instance, faces this. I know the um, pine crest could not be a barrier island, nevertheless faces similar issues. We're all pretty much looking in the face of, I think the latest estimates were over three and a half trillion dollars by 2070 in terms of costs for adaptations and, and, and buffering against sea levels. So these are things that are well understood. This is a common consensus and that's very important. The second thing that's important is that residents believe, or the respondents, I should say, believe in a proactive approach. They're not waiting to see, at least from what the sample fund, waiting to see what the future holds. They're willing to take a step forward today, sooner than when those impacts occur, which is, again, an excellent finding because it shows that there's consensus. And I come back to that, that term, consensus. Consensus may not mean a general direction. I mean, it could mean a general direction. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean a specific step to be taken. That's something that, that you all will have to discuss with, amongst each other and, and ourselves, being, being residents of this county and South Florida. And the third is that there is a favor for a multi-pronged approach. And that's, that's very good because there is no single solution to this problem. Um, residents from the sample were as much in favor of infrastructure development in terms of raising roads as they were in terms of green technology, as they were in terms of sensible outcomes such as cooling roofs, rebuilding some of our degraded ecosystems because that's really where we get our ecosystem services from and that's where there was great 95% of the sample said we should do something about restoring mangroves, that we should bring back dunes, use nature to help us in this battle against sea level rise. So as long as we have all of these, these, these points of convergence, I think that we have a good first step to start from to hopefully combat this immense problem. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm going to be brief and, and summarizing some points. There's a main event, there's a presentation you'll hear from uh, from staff. But I do want to respond in a, in a both in a current and future way and say that on behalf of our mayor, Mayor Jimenez, the county commission, and I'm sure County Commissioner Suarez, uh, we want to be part of the partnership that you are creating uh, and looking at your work. Uh, we have other cities, uh, former Mayor Lerner was a, was a leader in my investment in, in four, 14 ahead, uh, Mayor Levine in, in Miami Beach. Uh, so, it's a partnership between the cities and the county. Uh, we'll have to prioritize as we move forward, uh, but it's really exciting for me uh, to ask a look at the county, the 2.7 million people. Uh, we have many different situations, and your situation being out here on the island, part of an island chain, I think is particularly unique, and you taking the initiative. So, how can we help? What are some of the things we're doing, and what are some of the things we might do in the future with you? Um, the county um, has a history of working in this area that really goes back several decades, really working on the side of trying to reduce energy uh, consumption, and shift our fuels, and reduce greenhouse gases. It was more recently that we started looking at the adaptation issues which you're looking at, the long-term effects of coastal flooding, and, and then over time, sea level rise. We were uh, forced ahead with a citizens task force uh, chaired by now clerk of the courts, Harvey Rubin. Uh, we moved forward with reports and studies uh, at the direction of the county commission. 
and now we're in implementation. And I did, there is a handout uh, that says it's a Department of uh, County document that I'll just refer to in a couple ways. So you feel free to look at that. And, and uh, the other document I handed out has to do with the Rockford program which I'll briefly mention. But specifically, um, the county is now prioritizing uh, our county assets on their vulnerabilities. Uh, just down the road is one of the largest uh, sewer treatment plants on the entire East Coast. Uh, it is undergoing a complete uh, upgrade, and as part of that upgrade, it will be protected from a severe hurricane and six feet of sea level rise. We're designing a new uh, treatment plant to the west. And the water treatment plants are also being upgraded. So we're looking real time to protect uh, our investments in infrastructure that serve you, that you're paying as taxpayers, that you're paying as ratepayers, so that we have that ability to provide those services. That's a minimum thing to do to start. We realize that this problem is much more uh, complex than just focusing on our infrastructure. But if that fails us, then we fail our most important job, which is to serve you as citizens and to provide an economic base for the county and the cities. If we lose the economic base, many of the things that we are talking about tonight, we won't have the resources to do it. So it's a fine, finely balanced game of moving forward, uh, making and addressing real issues, at the same time recognizing the importance of maintaining uh, a quality of life for you and for our businesses and for our visitors. In addition to focusing on the uh, priority uh, infrastructure, uh, we are in the process of procuring um, international and national experts to help us look at what we're referring to as an enhanced capital plan. That's where we really are going to be uh, evaluating the feasibility of much more major uh, commitments to, in Miami-Dade County uh, to protect us long-term from sea level rise. Those are real challenges, ladies and gentlemen. I would not want to lead you to believe you know those answers today. Uh, we have uh, a set of projections that we have produced regionally to help us guide us, but we are not we are not going to wait for the events that occur. We're going to start now to try to plan them and, and frankly bring some decisions uh, back to the county commission uh, that I'm sure will each city commission also in our residents will want to see as we do those. That's another year, year and a half off. Rockefeller Foundation presented us an opportunity to sort of leverage this work that I've described to you to form a partnership with two of our 34 cities for the purposes of getting in the program, but a commitment to expand the partnership to all 34 cities. And that we were fortunate to get in. We, we operate under the formula of Greater Miami and the Beaches, the Zoe of Greater Miami and the Beaches. We're just starting the two-pager that, uh, that's in your handouts will tell you more about that project. But uh, look to that as a, a way for us to address a lot of these issues and bring to bear experts that the Rockefeller Foundation will put at our disposal. We're one of 100 cities around the entire world that is in this ex experiment. And, uh, we are learning from the ones that are gone before us, and we're sharing our information uh, with our counterparts in all other cities. Lastly, I'd like to uh, really identify the obvious for you, uh, that your village is on an island, uh, connected by a county road uh, to a state park, uh, going back through uh, to a whole facility run by the county. And on that stretch of seven plus miles uh, is the school board, the federal government, university, the state park, the county park, a sewer treatment plant, a very uh, robust building. But at some point, we're going to have to sit down and see what we can do together uh, on some of these issues. And I welcome that opportunity when the village feels it's the right time. I'm not, it's not something the county's going to initiate, but the county stands ready to convene with you, uh, if it's your desire, uh, in a, a discussion about how we might uh, assess these issues along that very unique chain. 
We have a model for that, which is briefly uh, referred to in the, in the material it's called an adaptation and action area. We've engaged that in an area in North Miami, North Miami Beach, Miami Shores. It's a drainage basin, so it's configured differently than uh, an island chain. But we're starting to look at all the issues that we are going to be talking about tonight at, from an intergovernmental point of view. Water doesn't care for city and county borders. It's going to move according to gravity and drainage and other things. And we need to address it in a holistic way. And that's why I offer tonight and in the future to, to be available to work with the village uh, and see how we can leverage the great work we're doing tonight. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you. Well, I always find that partnerships always have great outcomes. Um, having said that, the community foundation, together with the village, uh, hired Coastal Risk Consulting to create uh, basically a vulnerability assessment to take a look, a uh, scientific look, modeling, using a lot of modeling and stuff I really don't understand, but uh, taking all that into account to see where your, where your vulnerabilities lie within the, within the island. Um, the vulnerability report was uh, Will be, will be presented by Dr. Soden. And then we're going to be discussing some adaptation strategies that as you move forward with this information and you start developing your master plan, you can um, work together and, uh, develop and, and implement some of these, whether it's raising roads, whether it's more pump, these adaptation strategies need to be. That's a decision that you all will have to decide. My name is Brian Soden, and I'm going to be talking to you about assessment and various adaptation strategies for the village of Keats King. And uh, my role here and the role of, of Coastal Risk Consulting in general is not to uh, kind of persuade you or make decisions on certain areas, but really to provide you information for residents and village leadership so that they can get together and make decisions using information that's specific to the village and relevant to the so you can get together and make decisions on what is best uh, for the community so. um, And uh, really be uh, two goals of this. One is to uh, provide you information on what the current risks are from sea level rise and how those risks will change in the future. And also what various adaptation options are available to the village. Um, and I emphasize that these are hypothetical. No one has made decisions on these yet. Uh, we're giving you information about what the benefits of different adaptation options are uh, as a source of information for you to make uh, decisions. And uh, it's important to understand that the village is not alone in this. Obviously, all of South Florida and all coastal areas uh, throughout the world are experiencing this. Uh, several cities have sort of uh, taken the charge and put together adaptation plans for how to deal with sea level rise. Uh, very large cities like Boston, the city of Miami Beach, and uh, there's some common components among these plans that I'm just going to outline very quickly for you here. And uh, these involve community engagement, which is what this is, this process right here is very part of. It's important to get uh, provide information to the residents and to get feedback back to the residents about uh, what the risks and adaptation options are. Uh, there is also policy reviews, as well as uh, you've heard a little bit from the survey, green adaptation options, and of course infrastructure improvements. I'll go very quickly through the first uh, three of these and really spend most of the time uh, that I'm going to present to you talking about different uh, infrastructure adaptation options, since that's most of what uh, Coastal Risk has been doing in terms of modeling different uh, scenarios. Uh, in terms of community engagement, many of these things uh, the village has already uh, undertaken through the Community Foundation or other efforts, uh, but educational programs with citizens about uh, what the, uh, the risks and impacts of climate change are. We've heard that that was a, a, a very popular response in the survey. Uh, also getting the citizens themselves engaged in doing things like monitoring flooding that occurs. That's something that uh, citizen science uh, program within the village is already doing as well. Uh, there are also other options that, that other 
plans have started in terms of uh, providing the opportunity for residents to sort of audit their own vulnerability and exposure to sea level rise and what uh, adaptation options are best, most beneficial for them in terms of their individual businesses or homes. Uh, policy reviews, uh, that's another thing that uh, if uh, not already in place, is, I think is sort of an eminent part of this, maybe foreshadowing that option within the village, looking at different options in terms of uh, raising structural elevations, raising roads, uh, placing requirements on seawalls. Uh, those are all things that, uh, again, it, it, this process of engagement with the citizens, feedback into the village leadership, and providing information is, is an important part of it. Of course, green adaptation options are always very popular. Um, uh, things like uh, beach renourishment, that all of these things are, are uh, popular within the village, and, and many of these are already underway uh, in various aspects. Uh, uh, mangrove uh, renourishment or reforestation, um, green roofing, permeable roadways are another option that's particularly relevant here. Um, in general, these tend to be somewhat less effective on average than uh, uh, the more intrusive uh, infrastructure adaptation efforts, uh, but nonetheless, there's still things that are worth considering. Um, and finally, uh, the, what I'm going to spend the rest of the, uh, my uh, 15 minutes or so here discussing are various hypothetical <coughs> scenarios for infrastructure improvements within the village. And I'm going to give you sort of before and after pictures of uh, what these different adaptation options uh, uh, would look like and how they would uh, uh, lessen the impacts of sea level rise within the village. And we'll look at things such as storm drainage improvements, which is something that's already uh, been put in place within the village, uh, uh, elevating sea walls or Placing sea walls in certain areas around the village, raising roadways and, and, uh, and, and structural elevations, as well as pumping systems. And we're able to provide these before and after scenarios looking into the future uh, using a modeling system that's been developed within uh, Coastal Business Consulting, I'll just say CRC from now on, just to give you a, a very quick uh, overview of how we do this. Uh, we uh, take advantage of, of uh, technology. Uh, we use uh, recently available, very high resolution information on what the topography of Key Biscayne looks like using LIDAR measurements. We incorporate that with local tidal records and uh, uh, consensus projections of sea level rise into the future to identify those regions uh, that are at risk from flooding now and how that risk will evolve into the future. And then the after of looking at various adaptation scenarios and showing how these adaptation scenarios uh, will uh, make life a little bit better within the village. So just to give you some indication of, of what the problem are, is and the resolution and fidelity of the modeling system we've developed, what this map on the right shows are those locations within the village that are already experiencing tidal flooding uh, during king tide events. So these are the events that typically happen in uh, October and early November. Uh, and there's a number of streets, as you can see, within the village that are uh, already experiencing flooding. And the areas with the black arrows pointing to and, and that have the, the uh, outline indicate regions where there's already been uh, reports within the village of street flooding. Uh, the blue areas indicate regions where our modeling system indicates that flooding should be occurring. And you can see uh, for most of the regions where there are reported flooding, the model is consistent with those predictions. There are a few regions down here along the western boundary of the island where the model suggests that flooding should also be occurring, uh, but they haven't yet been reported to the village. It's maybe because some people weren't reports of it, or that we have a very low threshold for our definition of when flooding occurs within the modeling system. So it may be that uh, the, the water hasn't accumulated to a point yet where residents have actually complained about it yet, but that uh, in the near future these roads will be experiencing flooding. 
So this provides you some indication of, of both the, the fidelity and the resolution that we're able to model flooding both now and then looking forward into the future. And you may ask, why is the flooding not limited to the coastline and why is it occurring so far inland? Part of that reason is, is, is because of the storm drainage systems that you have. Um, this is, shows a typical scenario of how the, the storm drainage systems were designed to work. That when uh, there's uh, rainfall and runoff that collects in the storm drain and then runs out into the ocean. However, when you have rising sea levels, what happens is that the sea levels rise above the outflow of the storm drain and then it goes through the pipes and then shows up in your front yard or in the front yard of this uh, person's house here. Now, the village has already put in place backflow preventers, which is shown schematically here as this little white arrow, which are designed to prevent the seawater from flowing up through the pipelines and into your front yard or streets. So these will address some of the flooding, uh, at least initially, that occurs from rising sea levels. And we'll look at how effective things like backflow preventers are in, in a minute. Um, but just to give you uh, a glimpse, uh, this shows two maps of what the uh, tidal flooding looks like on the village today, shown on the left, and what our model projects that the tidal flooding will look like in about 30 years due to rising sea levels. And you see there's a tremendous expansion of the areas. It's no longer limited to just a handful of streets uh, but virtually every street in the village will be flooded on, uh, on high tides in the future. Quick question, what rate of, of uh, the sea level rise are you projecting for that? In this case, we use uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers medium-high projection, which basically says that uh, uh, sea level is rising due to thermal expansion and due to uh, the melting of ice that acknowledges that the fact that places like Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet are melting and they're contributing a significant amount to future sea level rise. At what so this is roughly, this equates to roughly one foot of sea level rise over the next 30 years. One foot in three years? 30 years. Oh, 30. 30 years, yeah. One foot in three years. It's, like, it's time to sell, <laughs> Okay. Uh, but, uh, so what we want to do is, uh, again, we're not here to advocate particular scenarios. If you're happy with the picture on the right, that, you know, that can be fun. That can be a way of life in the future. But we want to look at what are different adaptation options that can be done to reduce the impact of sea level rise on the village. And so one scenario is to uh, put up seawalls in vulnerable places for, uh, to prevent the overland flow of tidal waters onto the land and to include backflow preventers. And so the picture on the left shows the village flooding with no adaptation efforts. So we just keep doing it. In fact, we take out the backflow preventers that are already in place. And the picture on the right shows what the village would look like with backflow preventers in place and with sea, sea walls to prevent the overland inundation of water from the ocean. And you'll see that it does reduce the, uh, the, the amount of flooding in the interior of the island, but as you get closer to the edges, it's less effective. And the reason for that uh, has to do with the geology. That as the sea level rises, the water table underneath the ground also rises. So a perimeter defense will work in places like the Netherlands, where they have a very impervious uh, uh, geology. But in a place like South Florida, where the water table is free to flow up and down as the sea level rises, um, what you end up with as the sea level rises, you get groundwater seepage from underneath. And here's just a, a picture illustrating what that looks like. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, perimeter defenses uh, by themselves do not completely stop the impacts of sea level rise, and you have to look for other efforts uh, to deal with these issues. Um, and certainly one option that we heard discussed in the survey and, and is already, uh, has already happened in parts of Miami Beach is to increase roadways. 
And these are usually uh, one of the first infrastructure adaptations to take place because the roadways are typically the lowest elevations with intervention by design. Um, and so they're the, the first to get flooded, they're the regions that are being flooded now. And we can model the impact of what different increases in roadway elevation would look like. So the picture on the left shows the areas in Key Biscayne roadways alone that would be flooded in 2045 if nothing was done. And the picture on the right shows what the flooding would look like with one foot elevation increase in the roadways. And just for reference, uh, Miami Beach increased their roadways up to three feet in certain regions. So I'll give you some perspective on the numbers that we're talking about here. And you can see with a one foot increase in roadway elevation, there's still some regions that are vulnerable to flooding by 2045. Uh, but if you increase them by two feet, uh, basically the entire building uh, um, however, there are consequences to elevating the roadways, um, and it, it's something that, as we'll see in a second, needs to be done in coordination with uh, other infrastructure improvements and, and changes in, in property. <coughs> and uh, what this shows, these two maps, which are very busy, um, they show the areas of rainfall accumulation, what it looks like currently, and you'll see that, uh, it may be hard to see, but most of the rainfall currently accumulates in the roadways because those are the most elevations. That's where the storm drainage system is that allows the rainfall runoff to uh, be removed and, and, and dumped out into the ocean. If you increase the roadway elevation, however, you change the locations of where the runoff accumulates. And so that means that you can't elevate the roadways in isolation and think that you've solved all the problems. You, that has to be done in coordination with changing the elevations of the properties. Right? So you don't have rainfall runoff accumulating in your front yard and standing there instead of accumulating and, and flowing through the drainage system out into the ocean. So this is really to, to illustrate the importance and the interconnectedness of these different adaptation strategies. It, it can't be, as Manu said, there is no single solution here. It has to be a multifaceted approach, and things have to be coordinated with each other. Um, and so to give you an, an indication of the, the types of elevation increases that would be needed to prevent flooding not only in the roadways, but also on the adjacent properties uh, to prevent flooding here. We've gone through a number of, of uh, scenarios. The left shows the region vulnerable to flooding with no adaptation efforts. In the middle, we've identified those regions that are most vulnerable to flooding and increase their elevation by one foot, and then on the right, by two foot. And this shows the regions that are subject to flooding uh, by 2045, so 30 years in the future. And quick question? Uh, in this case, we haven't distinguished between uh, if there's a structure on the property or if it's just a, a low area in your in your front yard. We've just identified those regions that are uh, lowest and most vulnerable to flooding, and then elevated those regions. So it makes no distinction. Right now, we haven't distinguished between. Uh, if it's your property or your house. And, and it brings a very important point here. These are very idealized <coughs> scenarios that we're presenting here, right? But the tools are available to make very specific uh, uh, tests and decisions about what would happen if it was in your, your front yard or your house that you wanted to check. And I think it's important to understand that adaptation efforts are very dynamic things. It's not you're going to write down a plan today, and write it in stone, and then you're going to stick to that plan for the next 30 years. It's a very dynamic thing that depends on the timing uh, of different implementations. When you raise roads, when you raise new properties, when you change the sidewalks, when you put in the back planners, when you start considering putting in pumps. And so you need a, uh, a tool, and I'm showing you these here, that you can test these different scenarios. So there's almost an endless number of scenarios that you could, that you could look at 
And you need to have an efficient tool in order to test those scenarios. And, and that's what we're trying to deliver here. Okay. So thank you for that question. Um, and this just illustrates that this is showing combinations of multiple, again, and this is very idealized, but we're showing uh, increasing the most vulnerable properties, or the, the road weight by one foot, and the impact of backflow parameters and seawalls. And this shows you that combination. But it's not just, uh, you may not want to consider just a uniform elevation. You may only want to elevate certain roadways or certain parts of the island and so forth. And so, uh, again, it's a very dynamic process. And you need to be able to test and examine different scenarios. Um, and that's what our modeling does. And uh, so just one last slide to, to kind of summarize is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, Jim Murley and the village leadership are not going to solve all of the problems. And uh, it, that it really does involve a partnership between uh, the local governments at the county and, and municipality, and hopefully the state and the federal level, as well as individual property owners. Um, you know, so the, you know, the city of the county isn't going to go out to your property and elevate your, your air conditioning unit or whatever it is involved in flooding. It's going to involve a partnership between both sides of it. And that's what this U-shaped slide is designed to commit. And uh, I'll just put my final remarks up there, and then I'm, I'm free to take any questions. Yes? When you're saying the seawall, are you talking about the deep side of the island as well? Yeah. Fortunately, the island has yeah. sort of a net. Oh, I'm sorry. So she was asking, uh, basically, where would the sea walls be located? Would it be on the lee side or the or the windward side, the, the ocean side of the island? Fortunately, most barrier islands have natural sea walls on the ocean side. You have the beach and the dunes that act as natural sea walls there. So it's important as part of the green adaptation strategies to make sure you can nourish those so, you know, because it's much more enjoyable prettier than the seawall, right? So yes, the seawalls are primarily uh, intended for low-lying areas on the, on the leeward side of the islands. The, the, uh, the time that you mention in this model is actually 28 years, which isn't very long. So my question is, when you get to 2045 and you've done something to jack things up by two feet, and now we find that sea level rot is going to rise two more feet in the next 15 years. What do we do then? And, and, and are there numbers of prognosticating what the future rises will be after 2045 in this army thing that you mentioned earlier? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good uh, question and comment, and it's 100% and it's correct. These, uh, unfortunately, are not permanent solutions here. And so, uh, you know, elevating the roadways by two feet will buy the village uh, 30 years, you know, plus or minus. Um, if in 2045 they decide to elevate roadways by another two feet, it's not going to buy you another 30 years. It's going to buy you another 15 years. And that's because the rate of sea level rise is not just that the sea level rise is increasing at a steady rate, but it's also projected to accelerate and accelerate to the point where uh, upper level projections are you know, on the order of 60 by the end of the century. So you can uh, do the math and, and draw your curve in between there. But yes, uh, you can think of uh, two feet as a bargain now if you get 30 years for it. In the future, it won't be uh, as, as effective. Oh, do you want to think about Sorry, I, I'm being called to uh, sit, go sit down and take questions later. Oh. Well, okay, one more question. Um, the flooding that you were showing, was that during the King Tide? Yes. Uh, okay. And then also, if you raise the roadways, are your parks going to be saturated? Are you playing soccer? If the roads are elevated, that's great, but the ground is still saturated, correct? In, in certain, I have to go back to the map and look at it, yes, but. Elevating the roadways doesn't mean that uh, every, every place remains dry. Uh, so there are uh, low lying areas that are roadways that are vulnerable as well. The reason why we want to have all these presentations first is so that you can all develop, you have enough information. You have, now we're going to hear from Mariana, who's uh, with the village.
um, so that you know what's been happening as far as policy um, that the village leadership has engaged in. I'm sure you, many of you are aware, but uh, Maria is going to give a quick overview of what you've been working on as far as with regards to flood ordinances and the future policy reviews of other upcoming um, decisions that will be coming up. Good evening, Maria Rodriguez Party. I don't have a very long title, but uh, today I'd like to use a lot that was mentioned. Um, community rating system coordinator. Community rating system is a voluntary incentive program that the village has been participating since 1998. And basically it's um, it's, it's meant to reduce flooding and to uh, prevent it by um, many different Activities. One of the main ones being policy review, and um, we're very excited because we just completed updating our flood insurance uh, flood, flood policy ordinance, and we're going to be we're going to be presenting it to council first reading March 12th. One of the main recommendations in this ordinance is raising the elevation of future construction. This, um, this will achieve two things, not only anticipation of sea level rise, but will also offer additional savings to every flood insurance policy holder in the community. We're going to be um, getting the final, um, the final draft from the uh, Florida Division of Emergency Management, and we're going to be ready to uh, move forward on that. Um, afterwards, the next step would be looking into our zoning ordinance, uh, maybe incorporating some point base, encouraging construction to have some green components, some water retention. Uh, I know some of you had um, mentioned the the fact that still some homes are at um, the current elevation and um, one of the main aspects and one of the main goals is to retain the water for this new construction. I mean wells, um, water retention um, through walls. Um, this next step will be spearheaded by our director, the Building and Soil Department, um, Jeff Kronachik. He will be, um, the immediate next step will be creating a committee to um, assist him in doing so. And um, specifically looking at the Florida area ratio, the square footage of a property versus square, square footage of construction. And that is the next step um, being presented in terms of what's review. So till March 12th, for first reading for our flood ordinance, we're anticipating that um, everybody's going to be on board, and it's great timing because we are about to be visited by ISO, and if we do um, achieve our goal, we'll be able to provide all policy, all flood policy holders in the community an additional five percent, or a total of twenty percent. In the um, savings in your in your flood insurance policy. Thank you. That's great. Well, that's pretty good news. Savings. Um, so the village is, is is working and will continue to work on a lot of policy changes uh, upcoming. So stay involved. Next, we we learn by by looking at what others others are doing, and we've heard a lot about what Miami Beach has done. There are other cities across the country, um, for example, the city of Boston that's engaged in a very robust adaptation planning process. They have a great plan. Um, that doesn't mean uh, that you all need to incorporate everything in that plan or anything, but looking at some of the elements that work and up at what others are doing might help you develop your own plan for the village. So with that, I'm going to call Austin Horn to be walking through some of the not going into too much detail, but some of the highlights of, of what these cities are doing so that, 
you know, as you all incorporate and, and, and engage in, in, in your solution um, adaptation planning, you have some samples that, of uh, things that are, are working. Yeah, and Brian went through basically all of them in his presentation, so I guess I could just explain the methodology behind why we chose these plans. Um, we drew heavily from the Miami Beach plan because uh, it is obviously located in the same area and experiencing the same type of sea level situations that uh, the village of Key Biscayne is. They've also uh, instituted one of the most aggressive infrastructure plans, um, probably in the nation of any individual municipality. So we thought um, there could be a lot to learn from them. And then for the city of Boston, they have uh, their study came out just a, a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month ago, but it's probably by far the most comprehensive study that has been uh, coordinated and published by any city in the United States. And there's, I think, particularly a lot to learn in terms of their community engagement efforts, which we're trying to uh, implement uh, right now through these types of meetings. Um, and then the community engagement and education efforts to get individual property owners uh, to understand what adaptation solutions are best for their property because like we've said um, not everything is going to be done by the county or by the village um, some parts of, of adaptation are going to be uh, up to the property owners so um, uh, yeah that's that's the two studies that we primarily drew from and that's the, the methodology behind that. You can find all of the recommendations in uh, the presentation that Brian presented. Thank you. As part of the uh, adaptation or mitigation for Cuba State, are there going to be funds made available for the school systems to uh, green their operations to provide in a way that educates more opportunity for the children to see what adaptations can look, uh, can look like? Specifically, we're looking at solar panels for Mast Academy. Just wondering what type of funding we might be able to request from uh, the city. The best answer I have is we actually do not own the properties or the buildings. It is owned by the district, but we've always traditionally been very good partners with our students, with our families, and with our, our uh, school facilities. Um, I know uh, as, as a policy discussion, our council and, and residents have raised uh, Greening initiatives uh, and, and piloting it, so that's something to explore. You know who we could communicate with as, as the next step to. I think the first step is to actually speak to the owners, which would be this district, and then take it from there and see what we could do together. But the, we can't make unilateral decisions, so it would be with the school board. And I suggest that this is a wonderful opportunity for the schools to take in the process. And I'm sure I personally would be glad to spend some time to develop a small teaching program for the model of what we're doing here. Because the way to go forward for 2045 is to have our kids know exactly what the problems are and exactly what steps they need to solve. What's the most points of elevation in TV and what's the highest point of elevation and maybe a median? Just so we have an idea of where we're standing, like literally, I guess. I can give you a rough idea of things change from one place to another. But the king, uh, king tides uh, last year, this year, last year, uh, went up 3.2 feet. Uh, and uh, it went over some streets, very few. Uh, about half an inch on top of the ground of the road. So you know that we have the low roads are less than 3.2 feet. Uh, there are three some. The uh, high roads, like uh, Grand Room near Towers, is like uh, five feet some. Uh, and you know, it's, it's far from having an inflowing problem. But yes, no, no, everything here is time related. You know, uh, time and water level is going to be changing. Uh, and the, the thing is, the 
then unlikely it's going to change. So uh, the the levels are going to keep going up. Uh, there, the houses, the new houses have no problem because they're being built ten feet high. You know the their floor plan. Uh, but the old houses, the uh, uh, old macro houses, and some of the others are five feet, 5.5 feet. So when we get into the issue of elevating the roads, we have to keep into mind that uh, we can go so much at a time without creating a problem for the existing uh, old residents. So, you know, you cannot go two feet of uh, the, the uh, three feet of the road, you know, elevated to five feet, and the house is five feet, so the water is not going to the house. And that's some of the problems that Miami Beach is facing, okay? And uh, we, we, we want to plan ahead of time so that we will do it in a, an incremental way uh, that will make more sense to deal with the existing structures that are wrong. Uh, the future, obviously, is not going to be a problem with the higher houses, but uh, we cannot go two feet at a time without creating another problem. So uh, it, it, this requires a, a, a careful planning on how we're going to increase our structures' elevations. Okay. Okay, we're going to take questions, now it's this side's turn. And please use the microphone because we are recording this so that we have a documentation of all of our discussions and all of our questions and answers. And they will be posted on the Community Foundation's website. Thank you for presenting where the king tide would, would show up. Uh, will, would we also expect more frequent tides, and can that be modeled? You know, what would be the effect on our day-to-day -day lives here? The, the difference between the average, the difference between the average high tide and the king tide is about a foot. So normally now, uh, the, the high tide is two feet, and that's not a problem for uh, creating a. In, uh, you know, flooding into into any locations, uh, and the, the king tides is a, is a foot higher. It's a 3.2, and it's going to keep increasing. We don't know how fast. You know, we we plan on six inches half a foot for 2030. It's our plan. But you know, when we get to 2030, we have to see how you know it's going to be a foot or, or another half a foot. We don't know. I apologize. My question was, how frequently would we get floods, not how high they would be, because if the street floods and nobody can get to my shop, mm -hmm. then that affects my business. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think Jose. Uh, a good perspective on it so that the king tides are about a foot higher than the average high tide right now and in 30 years sea level rise about a foot so what that means is that the king tide today will be the average high tide in about 30 years so it would be um, the flooding you experience today would be almost a daily occurrence not limited to just a few weeks during the fall I printed out a paper today that's in the back of my car that spells out those issues for the whole of the East Coast, and I can send you a copy of it. Uh, NOMA has a site for a list of 335 long term train tie stations, and I picked uh, Miami Beach over the Royal Island Avenue. And on their site, it shows that the, the, uh, it's rising at 2.38 millimeters, plus or minus 0.43 millimeters per year which means in 100 years, it will rise 7.67 inches to 11.6 inches. So what's going on for the Miami Beach State? If you look at the, the long-term trend over the past century, it's been rising about uh, an inch a decade over, 
movement centric. But there is okay. this is 50 years from 31 to 86, 81. So that's 50 years. And two things, two things with that. One is that there has been an increase in the rate of sea level rise, especially here along the east coast of the U.S. within the last 10 years or so. So why is it not reflected on the data? You have to look at a trend just over the last 10 years instead of this is and if you if you look at the rate of sea level rise just over the last 10 to 20 years, it's much larger than it has been over the last 50 years or last century. Uh, uh, one thing that I, I should add to that is that the railways from another period of time to another period of time, it's yes. plates from and, uh, we have that information. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't and, know uh, what we're looking at <laughs> that information. Uh, I don't know what you're looking at, but uh, uh, and well, you, you, you said that we will be saying yes, yes. But uh, the, the, the curves that come out of that projection. I just want to understand what's going on because I see flooding in Miami Beach or according to the NOAA monitor station, it should be flowing, so what's going on? Well, the fact, the fact is in the, 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 the fact in, in Miami Beach is that the water in the road goes eight inches over the road. And regardless of whatever any story or anything says, this is facts. And here we when they go eight inches over the road, uh, we go half an inch. So we are about eight inches higher than them. And we are probably like 20 years uh, behind in facing the problem. But the problem will come, okay? That's, uh, it's inevitable. We'd be happy to take a look at that paperwork that you have specifically um, to get a better understanding to no, this is this is very good because this is exactly what we want citizens to do to participate in the dialogue, and we are all learning as we're going. So thank you. Next question on this side. Um, I, I think the there's a couple of issues that that I think are very concerning is the speed and rate of development that has been happening on the key, and this creates a, a stress on the storm drainage. And a lot of the construction where we're supposed to have zero runoff on our homes, there's a, there's a lot of lot coverage. Uh, so I think that the, the proposal that's coming up now is very, very important uh, to keep uh, the runoff coming off of the properties and also the sizes of the home. Uh, because uh, all those roofs and all those driveways and the tennis courts and so on, all that creates water that then the village has to handle. And, and, and expel all the road. So I, I would strongly suggest that you see what the runoff policies are regarding construction, uh, especially on the new construction. The other suggestion I have, I think that the, the way that roads are built now today are really not going to be a solution for what we're doing. Because, I mean, basically they're solid, they're not porous, uh, they're crowned, and they're made, they're made to kick the water off to the sides and then to be carried off with the storm drainage. Um, I think that you're going to have to come up with, with new engineering where the road could actually retain uh, a great deal of water and give it an opportunity to expel and you'd be able to rise it and not expel it off to the sides, but actually that it go below one or two feet and, and it, it'd create like a storm type of drainage in a road system like that. So, you have to look at new types of engineering where, where the old ones are just not going to make it. So this is just suggestions, not, not really so much questions. But. This is exactly what we want to hear uh, as, as you move forward um, in your adaptation planning. Again, everyone's doing, all these cities that are engaging in this process are all, we're all working in, in progress and experimenting. This, these things have never been done before. We've never had to deal with these issues before. So, you know, I'm um, sure there are going to be a lot of creative solutions coming, particularly out of South Florida.
and uh, the village is in a good position to be a leader there. So. Yeah, it, that's a very good suggestion. Uh, I know that the city of Chicago, of all places, uh, has an, an ordinance where every new sidewalk has to be porous and it has been trained. And how would you get our engineers up to get my engineering friend over there to look at the way roadways can be porous? Uh, I think that's excellent. We need some rethinking, but I think it's an excellent suggestion. I noticed in the resiliency plan, it talks about buried lines, burying the utility lines. How, how is that? How does it make any sense in the context of rising sea levels to bury lines when the sea level is rising all the time? To, to me, it's just completely counterintuitive. I don't understand it. Does anybody shed any light on why that's part of a resiliency plan? I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm, uh, but uh, my comment is this that those on the ground utilities are on the water. They're on the water. It's like there is utilities on the ocean. Uh, and they are made to, to be uh, waterproof. So, uh, and it's, it's a lot better than something in the air that it could be uh, wind uh, impacted or that type of thing. So, but, you know, that, I can tell you, we have a lot of lines already on the water. They work. It's not a problem. The structures uh, and the boxes and those things uh, are more impacted by by flood. Every house then has to be elevated every time the seawater comes up because I don't think the connections are, 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 are waterproof. I, I, I again I just don't understand how it can be how it can be part of a resiliency plan. Yeah. To be philosophical, I think up to 10 years ago, Florida thought about wind as its major hazard, and we did all kinds of things, including after Hurricane Andrew, to put utilities underground so that it wouldn't get blown down. We're now having to think about flooding as our major hazard, and we're going to have to rethink a lot of things, including uh, the points you make. It's my understanding that Mother Nature is working overtime to bring all that carbon that we've burned back to, to the earth. And our grass and our trees and our bushes are growing at, at record rate uh, to, to do just that. EPA recommends that towns like ours gather all that, gather all that material and compost it and take that compost and raise their sand dunes and that that compost will enhance the growth of the seagrass and turn two foot root sections into four foot root sections. And Miami had an absolutely wonderful compost facility up until about two years ago on Virginia Key. And I'm wondering if there's any chance that we could reopen that. Our, our lawns and our bushes and our trees are all trucked at great expense to keep his king residents at the homestead where the, the farmers greatly appreciate it. And I, I just wonder if we couldn't do something locally. Yeah. My question, uh, I live on the 200 block of Buttonwood, okay? So we, as Judd knows, had the first installation of the sewer, sewers, correct? Right. New sewers? Okay. We're still flooding. So we were inconvenienced and that happened. We're still flooding. And we're supposed to be one of the highest streets other than the streets you were mentioning before. I mean, I, obviously there are no guarantees, but those of us that have already been inconvenienced and this continues to happen, what else do we do? I mean, what, what, what's our, we don't have an option other than maybe if, what if, whatever, what so on and so forth. And I'm an elevated home. I was, our home was originally built in 63, thank God, the builder elevated to 10 feet. So we're up 10 feet, but it's already coming up half our driveway when we're flooded. So those of those of those, I'm a realtor. So imagine my clients that I'm selling on actual level homes. So, you know, this is a huge concern as you all know, but we need action quicker than, you know, 2035, 2045, whatever it's gonna be. We've got to do this now. So we need more and more and more of these.
Thanks, Jeff. We need, we need this like yesterday to be able to have this happen. And let's start doing what we need to do, but let's get together. This is crazy. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, Melissa, are you here? Maybe you're the one who can answer this question. Uh, you said that the survey was sent out to people you had email addresses for. So, like, how many email addresses was it sent out to? It was sent out to over 6,000 people. Okay, and what was the return? We had uh, 512 responses. So those results are based on the 512. Yes. The current population of the key is about what, 12,000 now? Stati it's statistically significant. 500 is the marker for statistically significant. And that's why we presented the data. We didn't present it until we had the 500. Okay, I was just, I was just curious about that. The other comment I'd like to make, which kind of borders on a political issue, but I really think it's a reality, is that, um, well, first of all, I really like the comment about the communities working together. I think that is critical in general in the world we live in today. People have got to work together. But going a step further, you know, the secret level rise, and I hope I don't step on anybody's feet, but it has to do with global warming. That's all there is to it, as far as I'm concerned. We have some scientists here. I don't know, but hey, if you know our politicians are not on board to say, yeah, you know, the world is facing X, Y, and Z. We've got to support this. We've got to come up with more money. We've got to bring our best minds together. And so I'm really glad to hear, at least in Dade County, that our mayor of Dade County is supporting this. You know, I guess as a citizen and having lived here on campus game for almost 36 years, I'm thinking, hey, how can we get how can we keep moving up there and getting the other people on board? I, that to me is so critical to this whole thing. And I do feel, and I won't be around for it, but in the future there's, you know, this world is changing now. What we're going into, we, we really don't know what's out there. It, it looks like, you know, uh, it's not the, uh, you know, the, the dinosaurs going away, but, you know, maybe at some point the human race will be the dinosaurs. I, I don't know. That's just well, my comments. Just to put a little more positive tone to your, to your remarks, um, communities like this that are already experiencing flooding, you have a voice because you have visuals. It doesn't matter who's causing climate change at this point anymore. The point is that there are communities that, are, that, are, that need to take action, that need to move forward, that are going to need the help of the state and the federal government for relief, as well as yourselves, private property owners are also going to be. So this is, this is a, a, a holistic responsibility. Resilience, to become resilient, everyone's responsible for that. If we want to sustain and sustain, you know, our, our life, our, our quality of life. So you have a voice, use it. Now more than ever. Um, but um, I, I want to, Brian, Dr. Sherman came up and, and, and wanted to make reference to the NOAA data, and he pulled up this slide. You want to? Oh, sure. Just to address the question about the rate, the local rate of sea level rise. This is data, uh, slide put together by a colleague of mine at the end of this morning, Dr. Brian McCulby, who's also on our advisory board here for Coastal Vista. And what it shows is the data from the uh, Virginia Key Tidal Station, and it shows data over the last 50 years, and the linear trends over different periods, and those are the, the, the uh, straight lines and numbers underneath. So, over the last 50 years, the linear trend is 0.22 inches a year, which is about two inches a decade, uh, which is roughly double what the, if you look over 100 years, it's about one inch a decade over 100 years. Two inches a decade over the last 50 years. If you look over the last 10 years, it's almost five inches a decade locally here at the Virginia Key Tidal Station. That's what the linear trend is. And then even over the last five years, it's even higher than that. And the point is uh, not to put too much stock into these trends that are 10, five, or 10, or even 20 years long, because it's still a, a very noisy thing, but just to, to note the acceleration at the rate of which sea level and the projections that we use for future sea level rise are based in part on uh, 
uh, understanding the process that have caused this historical rate of sea level rise and the increase in the rate of sea level rise. You know, we talked a lot about infrastructure improvements, but in terms of homeowners actually being more aware and taking action, is there a way for even the village to support us and kind of even maybe building a dummy's guide to going green that we can look at and say, okay, I'm willing to invest in solar power, for example. Um, I'm busy, I've been meaning to do it. If, if I knew three or five vendors that are pre-approved, if I have more information from a cost perspective that the government is willing to rebate me on those improvements, like just kind of give me and us as a community um, that kind of information so that we can take action. We have a very engaged community. Um, everyone's always in communication more and more so like through WhatsApp, Facebook, Keep Us Game Marketplace, etc. It's about just like sending that information out and I think people would really adopt it. Well, well that's a great suggestion and in fact, Coastal Risk not only just does data and modeling, we are also very, uh, we have partnerships with, with uh, basically build a toolkit. So we can run a model for your home, we can you know, suggest who to work with if there are issues or adaptation strategies that you want to implement in your home. And this is not, I don't want to sound self-serving or commercial, but a lot of cities are looking at implementing such as that, like a pre-approved vendor's list of, you know, who do I go to if I need, you know, you know, to elevate my, my air conditioning unit, for example, or other other things, or flood, you know, traps, I don't know, whatever they're called, <laughs> flood rates, or, you know, but these kinds of you know, tools and, and strategies that you can implement in your own home. And also, of course, solar and all the other things that you, you know, we should all be lowering our, you know, rate of consumption, frankly. So working with together with, with the village would be a great approach to create a toolkit for Okay, can I just follow up really quickly to give her some advice? Um, I work with the federal government in the last year and a half. I uh, worked with the DHS Sustainability Performance Plan, teaching my colleagues about the sustainability plan. The federal government is the biggest consumer of energy in our economy. The uh, Obama had an executive order preparing for sustainability into the future. They have Berkeley National Laboratories, which is the best minds in our country working on policies to provide sustainability uh, plans for the federal agencies. The Pentagon's quite worried about the military is being flooded, etc. Um, as far as the basis, the point is, if you go to NASA.gov, they have great resources on how to uh, incorporate more greener habits into your life. Uh, NOAA.gov also has great material and EPA.gov. So all of these agencies have wonderful resources for our citizens to look at because the federal government has actually invested a lot of money uh, in these programs. And, and also, of course, I can't miss, uh, we have the county here, the county has a, a, a website. I don't, I don't know what the, the uh, the actual offices, but there is a there's a document called Greenprint, and Greenprint is full. It's, it's more localized, so it's full of all kinds of uh, suggestions and ideas and yeah. um, strategies. And um, I believe it talks about Miami Green. Miami Green. Miami Green. So ciao. Okay, did I have questions? I have two questions actually. I'd like to know how we can find out how effective these cities that have gone before us have been in mitigating the issues and what things are the most cost effective. For example, if we have a limited budget, how can we learn from those that went in front of us and just assuming, and instead of just assuming all everything they did was equally helpful? So are you evaluating that and can you tell communities like ours where we should be putting our resources to have the most impact. And then secondly, on the beach renourishment side, do you have recommendations for ways we can maybe possibly add structures that would help retain our beaches as we renourish them and include some type of man-made structures in addition to the dunes to help make sure that we maximize our beaches as well? Uh, we pay close attention to what the city of Miami Beach has done learned a lot and I think one of the things that we did learn that it's important to have uh, for example community engagement we 
before you start raising roads or doing other things to get feedback and, and have people invested in the process of doing that. Um, I think the city might need to be more aggressive in, in, in doing that now. Uh, but there's other things, such as the impact that raising roads have on, uh, you know, there have been some places that did become more vulnerable to rainfall flooding now that they uh, raise the roads and put uh, tack load drainage on the drainage systems. And that's things that uh, we can be aware of, uh, more aware of the and realize that you need to uh, try to take those factors into account when you do a more holistic design of the In terms of cost effectiveness, we haven't really gone through the process of trying to put a dollar sign per uh, inch of, of flood water or something like that. But that, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what uh, we're asking you to consider. In terms of bee tree nourishment, there are things that can be done in terms of putting artificial reefs offshore to help uh, reduce wave action and, and uh, reduce the rate of bee erosion. My understanding from talking to some of the key is that there used to be things like that off the key to stand So we're told to remove them. Um, but something that could be worth The problem, the special problem that the islands have is that they don't have the coastwise drift of sand from up north. And therefore, we need to look at each beach in its particular characteristics. And the thing I found, without being specialist in this at all, is that um, general engineering systems don't work for each kind of beach. You really have to look at them in detail. And uh, yes, yeah, a mixture of man made and natural things. It's not all this problem. Something that I could say about the islands in the uh, city of Miami Beach have uh, gone to a uh, $300 million improvement of drainage infrastructure. And, construction. and uh, they have funded these through the utility service fees. And uh, they have gone from the year 2000 when it was three dollars per equivalent residential unit year ERU uh, to twenty-two dollars present. We are standing at about thirteen. So uh, I would anticipate that the level of improvement that we will have to be doing will have to increase our utility service fees with that and I'm not going to say how much, but if you compare with the similar situation in the city of Miami Beach, uh, we are about half of what there are right now. I may have um, a question and a comment all having to do with water. Um, I think some of this begins personal politics at home. I, I assume that the water that we use in our homes goes down the drain and to the Miami um, sewage treatment plant, which is right up the street from us. So I'm thinking um, things that occurred in my hometown is in Massachusetts, and I own here. Um, they they handed out little um, sand um, hourglasses to use for kids when they're in the shower. You know how long your teenagers stay in the shower every day? Um, don't leave the water running when you're brushing your teeth. Maybe don't wash your car so constantly down here. And then um, my question um, also, I assume indeed then that it goes down the drain and up to the sewage treatment plant, oh, which doesn't necessarily benefit us either. So anyway, that's what I just wanted to comment. We can begin some of this in our own homes um, with a little bit of force thought. As a home being there, I had the opportunity to live in New Orleans with Katrina. It and most of the solutions right there, of course, they were different because it was the Mississippi River, it was the Lake Concha Train, but also the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, most of the solutions were mentioned here. The solutions were, and they're still working, uh, improving the mangroves or the vegetation, uh, changing the impervious, impervious uh, surfaces, uh, asking all the owners to change the driveways for more friendly materials and more porous materials, also improving the height of the 
levies or the retaining walls in some areas it was necessary to repair them and the most important solution was to improve the water, water pump stations capacity I had not here, I didn't listen here anything about the water pump stations have you considered installing some or improving the capacity of the water pump stations? Oh, we have uh, presently two pump stations, one in, uh, in Ocean Lane Drive and another in uh, East Heather. Uh, those are existing pump stations. We are planning to install a new pump station uh, in the area of the, uh, the school area. Those are pump stations are expensive, uh, you know, uh, maintaining. We're, we're spending a lot of money to keep, make sure that they have, they are going properly and they're effective. We, we have the, the way we have handled these different to Miami Beach is that they pump into the bay, we pump into the aquifer. Uh, through wells, and uh, it's a more, in my opinion, much cleaner way of doing it. But uh, we will have to add more pump stations throughout the systems, particularly in all areas, uh, and it will cost money because uh, one pump station they talk about a million dollar a pump. You know, for, having one installed operational in the wells and everything else. Uh, right now we depend on gravity wells, which are good but not perfect. And our ocean falls that we're trying to uh, <laughs> back flow prevailers to avoid the high tides to come back. Uh, but yes, pumps is a is a is a is a depends. Okay. And New Orleans is such a particular unique uh, city in that it sits below sea level for virtually the whole city and relies on those levees to protect it from the water from the Pontchartrain and the Mississippi and the Gulf. So they also don't have the uh, forest bedrock that we have here. So they're trying to prevent water from coming in from all sides, whereas we're more or less trying to prevent it from coming up from the ground. The sea, the sea walls uh, would be less effective here than it would be in New Orleans. And with that, we're going to close up. This is just the beginning of now you have information. Now you start, you know, making decisions, planning. You're looking at your policies, uh, creating adaptation, you know, plans. And, and I'm sure there are going to be many, many more workshops coming up that the village will will want to engage all of you in. I want to commend all of you for being here, for coming out again. Um, there, if you have questions and you want to ask answers, if you have questions of the science team, we'll be happy to uh, answer those via email or whatever. Uh, through the Community Foundation, they, in your handouts, there's their email or their phone that you can call and get in touch with us or them. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it back over to the mayor. You have great leadership in your village. You should be very proud of what you're doing. Also, if you look at the, the handouts that you guys have, um, there's a website on there, and it has all the information that we presented at the last town hall right now, and uh, we'll be updating it with everything from this town hall. Uh, the recording will, the link to the recording will be up there, and any reports that come out of this town hall will also be uploaded, so just keep an eye on that if you're uh, looking for more information. I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank you very much for being so engaged and, and for participating in part of this process. Mr. Burley, thank you so very much for having the trip over. We look forward to working with the county uh, very closely in the next couple of years. Uh, to our wonderful panel, thank you for, for doing this, for um, for educating us and, and for brainstorming. Um, as we move forward, I'd like everyone to think of what our next steps are. Um, as you know, we've been trying to address 
all these issues, whether it's through um, addressing uh, potential hurricanes and storms and, 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 and hardening our infrastructure, but we now need to look at have a more holistic approach and be a little more proactive. So as we move forward, let's think about having a resiliency master plan and not just individual plans so that we can really um, evaluate the effectiveness and, and, and be able to, to tweak things and act nimbly. I thank you for your participation. I look for uh, I look forward to your participation in the future. Um, as we think about these issues and, and learn more about them, we are all very interested in your feedback, and uh, we will keep you informed as we rely on our experts and uh, look for best practices, not just locally, but really globally. Um, so we will keep you informed, and we are working for you in a proactive fashion uh, to make sure Key Biscayne is, is, uh, maintains its quality of life and we protect our $8 billion worth of resources. Thank you.